what, April 16th now, so I think we've all been dealing this for about six weeks. It seems like six years, but, uh, but it's only been six weeks. So um, I just wanted to uh, start out a little bit with uh, what's going on with uh, COVID-19 um, across uh, the United States. Um, so um, it would appear that um, a lot of places that were initially uh, hit the earliest and that would be the West Coast, are, uh, have definitely hit their peak and their numbers are coming down. Um, and some of those communities are starting to relax um, some of their uh, social distancing. Uh, California, notably, yet is not uh, relaxing any social distancing at all. They have a little bit further to come down on their mountain um, uh, before they're ready to do that. Um, they, uh, some of the hospitals in those areas that were hit hardest are actually starting to share some of their ventilators and other medical supplies with other areas now in the country. So, and that's a very good sign. So um, the big urban centers uh, in the U.S., particularly New York, um, looks like has hit peak, but uh, after their peak, they're seeming to have a longer shoulder, if that makes sense and their cases per day numbers are coming down more slowly. But it does seem like their hospitals aren't quite so overwhelmed now, uh, and the number of new admissions in those hospitals is starting to decline. I'm sure they would like them to decline quicker, um, as we all would for them, but, uh, but they are um, coming down, albeit slowly. Um, some of the other areas in the United States, including New Orleans, seems to be doing better as well. Uh, Detroit still struggling some, um, and uh, both with new cases and uh, and with hospitalizations. Um, so, what the, I think all this in summary for the U.S. says is that different places are in different timelines, um, and um, some places uh, you know have already gotten kind of slammed and are coming down. Some places have ne not been slammed at all. Uh, and are just sort of perking along. And then other places still have the potential um, to become a problem and, uh, and have their case numbers go up and have their own little epidemic in their own place. Um, social distancing and sheltering in place is clearly working in these areas. Uh, no ifs, ands, or buts. So here in North Carolina, um, um, our numbers are also coming down as a state and, uh, and in most of our communities. So um, in Charlotte, uh, the, no, the new cases per day are coming down. Hospitalizations are coming down some. Again, everyone would want them to come down quicker, but at least they're coming down at a rate. Here in our area, in the triad, as I've described in the past, rather than having a mountain of cases and going past the peak, we're more on a mesa, you know, that sort of flat high plateau. And, uh, and we're kind of perking along with that, um, with a low number of cases uh, per day um, in Forsyth and Guilford County um, and, uh, and in the triad area at large. Um, and our hospitalizations, new hospitalizations, seem to be just perking along. If anything, maybe there's been a little bit of a decline in cases from last week. I won't say we're past peak because you have to have a mountain to have a peak. Maybe, maybe there was a mound that we went over last week and a little bit more time and we'll know um, um, whether that, how meaningful that's going to be. But we're doing well here um, and our social distancing is really working and our sheltering in place is working. And uh, again, I, I gave a big shout out to all of us as citizens in our communities here. Uh, this is, uh, uh, we have avoided a huge problem here because of us, because of us as citizens and because uh, we're doing what we need to do uh, to keep transmission of the virus at bay uh, and from giving it to person to person. Let's bring it home to you guys. Um, you know. Every epidemic is nothing but a series of a million little mini epidemics that come together. And you're doing your part to keep transmission down in your community, in your neighborhood, and potentially even in your own household. So uh, keep it up. We're doing, we're doing a great job. Another shout out to our kids. Our kids, again, 
have taken a big brunt of this. Um, they're the ones who don't get graduation. They're the ones who are missing their friends. And, and the social milieu is really um, important for kids. And so uh, tell your kid today, thanks, uh, because they're, they're sheltering some burden too. The, um, so where, where do we go here from now? How do we get off our Mesa and the Triad? How do we get off of our, uh, off of our, and out of our, our epidemics that are past peak in our cities and, and in, a, in the state? Well, um, we're, we're, we're working on that. We're, we're closer to solutions, I think, than we were a week ago and definitely closer than we were two weeks ago. Uh, I know here in Winston-Salem, we've extended our shelter in place for, for what, three weeks, I think. Uh, basically, so it'd be like the second week of May, somewhere in there. Other cities and counties have done the same in our area. We're waiting to hear from the governor on this uh, and what we're going to do as a state. Um, and I've, as I said last week, it's, it's, uh, you have to weigh two things. You, know, you have to weigh safety and, and viral transmission and the epidemic on this hand, and then you have to weigh our economic viability on this hand, because certainly we won't want to get back to, to work and, and be able to be doing the things that seem more normal. Um, when, when we do relax our social distancing and sheltering in place, I think it's going to be a graduated process. So it won't be all at once, all at once. We, we won't wake up one morning and hear, okay, life's normal again, because it, it still won't be, because the virus is still around. Um, and we have to be careful to not let it recrudesce or resurge again. Because once, uh, once we relax our shelter in place, uh, then the, the virus is going to try to push its way back again. And so if you do it in a more gradual way and in a controlled way, um, it, 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 you're going to make that likelihood less. Um, so what might that look like? Well, it might be that some businesses might be able to open before others. We'll see what that list looks like. It might be that some activities will be able to come back before others. I think the ones that are going to be later on the list are going to be things that involve large congregate activities. What does congregate mean? Is where a lot of people come together. Um, and uh, things like sporting events. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, maybe um, our places of worship, depending on how many people would be there. You might see limitations still put in place on how big a gathering can be and what social distancing during that gathering might look like. Will restaurants come back? Probably. There may be somewhere in the middle as far as how we, we come back. Again, I'm, I'm kind of guessing because I'm there's a lot of people putting input into, into how this might look. But you may be going back to a restaurant where the tables are six feet apart, which is good news because you'll get better service. Uh, <laughs> more waiters, less people, always a good ratio. Um, but we'll have to wait and see how that happens. I don't really see much relaxation occurring at all until, until the end of April, personally. And I, and I wouldn't advocate that. Um, we do that until the end of April. I think the communities that have gone out to the, to the middle of May are, are the ones who are on the safest line, and that, that's where would my recommendations would be. I think we'll know a lot more by then. So what do we do between now and the middle of May when we relax our, our social distancing and sheltering in place? Well, there's a lot of work to be done. I think I mentioned last week, it's kind of like going down a safety checklist before taking off on an airplane. Um, and you need to make sure that you, everything is in place. For us in healthcare, we have to make sure we have enough PPE. Um, and uh, what's PPE? Personal protective equipment that we use to examine and take care of patients who might have an infection. Um, and then the second thing is, is that we have to have more availability of testing. Our, the testing availability in the triad is increasing every day, um, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute uh, for us specifically in our area. Uh, but um, um, we will need this testing to be able to identify people who have infections and then 
put that person in isolation at home, if that's the best place for them, and then, um, and then quarantine their contacts, which means people who have been in contact with that person will be spending 14 days more watching Netflix. So this is part of our, our strategy, I think, to get out of this, is because rather than quarantine the whole community of Forsyth County, for instance, what we will be doing is identifying the sick people and isolating and quarantining their contacts. And so it'll be a smaller segment of people. But our communities and our citizens are going to have to be ready for that because it, you know, it's again 14 days staying at home. Um, more if you're a contact of somebody who has COVID-19. But those tests have to be available and we have to have the uh, the people trained at the health department and such in order to track down those contacts. Um, some people have been seeing that there's apps on phones to be able to help with contact tracing. A little bit of privacy issues maybe with some of that, but public health, public health takes privacy into account for everything. And, um, and so I'm, I'm not sure that that's a, a big problem for those apps on the phones. Um, the other thing on the checklist that we need to have is, uh, is a community ready to do the relaxation of, of shelter in place um, at the right time and, and be adherent to it still. So um, again, it's probably going to be at least a few, week, few more weeks yet to endure this. The good news is, is that it's working. And then we'll start to relax, but we want everyone to relax in a controlled way together and be good citizens about how that's done, which means paying attention to it. Um, you know, I tell people that it's, we've done a great job with it now. It's worked. It's kind of like we've gotten three quarters of the way through a good basketball game, but the score is still real close. Um, if you're Duke, do you think Coach K is going to let up and just let it go and say, hey, we played a good three quarters. All right, we'll just kind of relax now and let it go now. No, Coach K is not going to say that. He's going to finish, uh, he's going to finish that game. And otherwise, the first three quarters are for naught. Apologies to all the UNC fans, by the way, or the Wake fans. <clears throat> so... Um, I've been getting a lot of questions, things about details still on, on where we're at and where we're going. Let's talk a little bit about testing and testing in our area. So at Wake Forest Baptist Health, we now have in-house testing, which means we're not having to send it out. We have the capacity to do all of our inpatients and our, um, and our ED patients right now and, uh, and healthcare workers. Uh, starting next week, um, we're going to be able to increase that capacity to doing more people. Um, and this will um, include um, patients um, who um, might ha be older, you know, over the age of 65, and or uh, have other um, underlying health conditions that, um, that uh, have a respiratory illness, a flu-like illness with fever and or cough, that they would be able to be assessed and then tested if thought to be needed. Not everyone needs to be tested. We're not going to be opening up testing yet for everybody. Um, we just don't have the capacity. And as we've talked about before, if, if you're otherwise pretty healthy and you think you have the flu, um, it could be COVID, but it doesn't really matter because you could just stay at home and, and, and put yourself in seven days of isolation. And then, uh, and then as you're at seven days, if you've had <clears throat> three days of improving health, uh, then you can leave isolation. And that, that's gonna work for, um, for almost everybody. Vulnerable patients are, are the ones who may be in nursing homes, ones with a lot of other line of health conditions or older or infirm. And for those people, it helps the doctor take care of those people if they have a diagnosis and what's going on. So those, those are going to be the next priority group. Um, we also want to make sure that people who live in group homes and or people who um, are in like dorm-like situations and living, if they have respiratory symptoms that they get tested because we have to do special things in those group settings to make sure other people don't get it. So that's uh, well, how we're going to be testing next week. And, and I think all of the healthcare facilities are, are ramping up their testing. 
Is testing going to be available at a point of care yet in your doctor's office? Doesn't look like it. <clears throat> Not yet anyway. Um, it, those tests are a little bit, have to be done in a, such a way that people without a lot of training or, or background in laboratory medicine can do them and most doctor's offices aren't quite set up for that yet. Um, but, w but as time goes on, I think we'll have more office-based testing um, in, in the future and that would be a good thing. A lot of the news about testing using blood tests, serology. What is a blood test measure? It measures your immunity um, and an antibody. An antibody is a molecule in our body that attacks the foreign agent, such as a virus, attaches to it, and then gets it out of the circulation or gets it out of the airway or out of the lung. And we can measure those antibodies. Uh, presumably, if you have antibodies, it might mean you're exposed. Um, to have been exposed to COVID-19. Some things about antibody testing though is it takes a while for the antibody to come up. <clears throat> From the time you're infected to the time we can measure good levels of antibodies is probably at least three weeks. So it's not really that helpful when you're sick because you haven't mounted that antibody response yet. It's more helpful in knowing whether you have been infected in the past. The other thing we don't know about those antibodies is uh, how well do they work? How well do they protect you? Um, and uh, we need to find that out. And so we do studies and we need to do some studies on that. And then the third thing about that antibody is how long will it last? So uh, if you get COVID-19 today, will you be protected in a year? So first we have to find out how protected you are and then if you are protected, how long that'll last. So we have some science to do, and that science will be going on through the summer. Uh, we, at, uh, we at Wake Forest Baptist Health will be participating in such, and I think you may have been hearing on the news about a large survey, we call it a serologic survey, that we'll be doing measuring um, antibodies in people to see how many people have been infected in our neighborhood and maybe how well that protection works. So be looking for that um, uh, as, uh, as we go on. <clears throat> Other things I'm asked about um, besides testing is um, masks. So we've been asked to wear cloth masks in public. Some grocery stores are requiring masks. Other places aren't requiring masks. What do these cloth masks do for us? Well. They're, they're basically, if, if you have COVID-19 and you're in that stage before you're sick and have symptoms and know it, which could be 24 hours beforehand, um, there is a, there's about 17% of people might shed virus before they actually have their symptoms. And so if you wear a mask, that keeps your respiratory goblets from getting out there in the environment. Um, wearing masks is, most, is, is more important when social distancing isn't possible. So for those more crowded markets and stores where it's harder to stay away from people, uh, places that see a lot of people where it's really you know, more crowded and there's more people traffic, um, they're not really necessary outside. Um, and uh, in, in your own home, you've already kind of exposed that area, so you probably don't need them in your own home unless there's someone in your home who's sick, and then that person who is sick should be wearing the mask because it keeps their goblets to themselves. Um, um, it, some hospitals in the region might be asking you to wear a mask when you come in uh, in the future, so if you're um, a patient or visitor um, to the hospital or have some business in the hospital, you should bring a cloth mask with you in case you're required to use that when you've come in. Um, the um, aspects about visitors and patients coming in hospitals, so we won't be relaxing our visitor restrictions until we're coming down the, the, the slope of our MESA um, more. Um, there's still some virus being transmitted in the community and so we still need to keep our patients safe. We still need to keep you safe as a visitor and we need to keep our staff safe. So um, we are still gonna be limiting visitors until the shelter in place orders are starting to be relaxed. And then like everyone else, we're gonna be relaxing visitor restrictions 
in a graduated and safe way. We don't have a timeline for that right now, um, but uh, we, w we will still be doing visitor restrictions for a while, as I think all of our healthcare facilities in the region. We coordinate this and do it together. So, I'm, and I know it's tough if you have somebody in the hospital or a loved one, um, and it's tough to not be able to be there for them, and it's tough for them not to be there, for you to be there for them. And we, we really understand that, but, but, but we have to keep everybody safe. Uh, the emergency department, if you have an emergency, as the phone call says, call 911, right? <laughs> Um, if your emergency isn't, isn't quite as much of an emergency, but you have to visit uh, the emergency room, as let's say while social distancing, you're doing batting practice and you break your wrist, uh, you can be safe going to the emergency department in, in any hospital in the area. Because all our hospitals, we, we take measures to keep patients who might have COVID separate from patients who don't. So the ED is still a safe place for you. So if you need to go to the ED, go to the ED. If it's not an emergency and you have, you're have sick, maybe it's with fever or cough, call your doctor first and see if you really need to go. Um, no one wants to go to an emergency room if you don't need to be there. So, um, And then um, lastly, um, when you are using a mask and cloth masks, um, there's a few things about it. Um, you, it's, if you're going to be taking it on and taking it off all the time, it's best just to leave it on. Um, because if you get the goblets from your respiratory tract on your mask, and there happens to be a virus, any virus there, and then you're messing with it and taking it on and off, then you get it on your hands. So, and then after you've taken your mask off, wash your hands, because then you get it off your hands, and it goes down the sink or it goes into the sanitizer. And so that's the right way to do it. And you probably don't want to be mucking with your mask or, or touching it a lot or messing with it. Although I, 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 see, I know it's hard to do because they're not always comfortable. But we don't mess with it if you can. Um, and then uh, lastly, um, so if you remember last week, I, I, I asked everyone to help me out with a personal thing that my wife, Vera, who's also an infectious disease doctor, wanted to uh, give me a haircut. I wasn't so sure about that. <laughs> and uh, so I asked everyone to vote. And so here's the votes. Um, out of almost 800 people who voted, 431, 55% said let it grow, be a hippie. And 45%, three, 355, said to get, get the haircut. So I talked to Vera, and she conceded, um, conceded the election, and said, you know, I really didn't want to cut your hair anyway. Um, and, uh, um, and she said, you know, I'm pretty busy, so I got other things to do with my time. So uh, until um, social distancing is really let up, <laughs> you will be seeing my hair grow. So bear with me <laughs> on it. So with that, if there's any questions, uh, I'd be happy to take questions. Um, uh, otherwise, I think we covered most of our issues. Uh, you mentioned the, the Mesa as opposed to a peak. Yeah. Do you expect that to continue, or do you expect any sort of peak in the future? So will our Mesa continue? Um, yeah, I think it will. I think it'll start to come down gradually. It, it may already be coming down, starting to gradually. But you know, when, when it's a Mesa, it's a little bit hard to know your changes in elevation. Um, so it'll, it'll come down gradually. I, what I don't think we're going to see, unless social distancing is released all of a sudden, I don't think we're going to see a big peak in our area. And, and man, isn't that good news? I mean, yeah. Who wants to be overwhelmed with an epidemic? No one wanted to be like New York. We felt for them, but we didn't want to be like them. And, and I really don't see that in our area at all. Um, so uh, hopefully we won't have a peak. We'll have, maybe have a little mound, molehill, I don't know, but, uh, um, but I, don't, I don't see a big peak in our area. And I think uh, a lot of people are, uh, I don't know if frustrated is the right word, but there were, there were, for example, protests in Michigan yesterday and that, that kind of thing. Do you, is it still important for people in these next few weeks until there's official word just to, to remain vigilant? Yeah, so yeah, I mean the protests that we saw in Michigan, um, 
I'm not sure how patriotic those protests were. I'm, you know, I'm not really a political person, but um, yeah, I mean, like I was saying, we're three quarters of the way through the basketball game. Let's be like Coach K. Let's not let up on this virus. And so, yeah, a few more weeks, two to three more weeks. Um, I know it's not fun, um, but, but, but why do something three quarters of the way through and then let go and, and blow the game? We don't want to do that. So, yeah, uh, a few more weeks. Um, I, I think we're through a good majority of it, but a few more weeks. Let's be steady. Dr. with the cloth, cloth masks, is there a way to clean them? Do you throw them in the washing machine? Would you spray them? Yep, your cloth them? mask, uh, I would throw it in the washing machine. Yeah, the detergent, hot water detergent, that's what's needed. And in, in a dryer afterwards is fine. Here's a chance to give a fashion statement too, right? With the different masks. We'll see how that goes. And I know the, uh, the big concern has been the places where older people stay, the retirement homes. What's, what's, what have you guys been doing to help them deal with this stuff? I know we have a bunch of those in our area. Yeah, so retirement homes and nursing homes. So, um, yeah, so we're working together with the county health departments um, with our nursing home populations. For those of you who have loved ones in the nursing homes, you know it's, um, it's really been tough because uh, we, one of the things we do there is limit visitors too because we don't want people bringing it in. We screen our staff going into those areas to make sure they're not sick. Uh, and then people with respiratory infections, we test them quickly. Um, people who are becoming new to the nursing home, so if you're a new nursing home resident, you might be spending, uh, depending on the individual home, 14 days in a certain wing and then, and then moved into the general population, so on and so forth. Retirement homes, um, you know, so like uh, we call them assisted living, they're a little bit different because most people have their own rooms and there's not as much congregate activity. They're being encouraged to social distance as well um, and in a lot of their activities where they would all come together um, you know have been more limited and um, so that we don't get groups of people together and again well, these are people we would like to test if they get symptomatic. Is, is that kind of a place that even if they're not symptomatic maybe like test everybody in one of those places so we know who's got it? Who right so that's a good question would we take a facility and just test everyone to see who's got it and who doesn't have it. So um, we don't, so asymptomatic people, people without symptoms, there's only really certain things that would prompt us to test them because the, if I said in the past, a positive test, it's hard to know what it means because we don't know you're gonna get it. Negative test doesn't necessarily mean you won't. So, so we would not be doing that unless there was an outbreak in that facility. So let's say we found out, oh my gosh, there's 12 people who've gotten COVID in, in, in facility X, um, then we, we might do that. And th that was done with the nursing home outbreaks in Seattle. We've done a few of those here in, the, in North Carolina in the nursing home outbreaks. So we haven't had a nursing home outbreak in our area here. Um, I should probably knock on wood, cross my fingers, throw salt on my shoulder because we don't want that. But uh, yep, there. Um, and then the, uh, sometimes there might be certain instances where we might test somebody before a surgery where, where the surgeon has to go up into the airways and we want to make sure they don't have it because there's a big aerosol generated with that. But other than that, we should probably not be testing it. Oh, women in labor will get tested, I think, um, starting next week. Um, at least in our facility. I think other facilities might be doing it already or will be. And the reason why is that um, labor um, is, uh, is, is if you've been uh, with somebody in labor or you've gone through labor yourself, you know it's an aerosol generating thing um, because uh, it's, uh, you're encouraged to, to make the noises and stuff that you need to to, to release your energy. And so the so people will be tested, I think, before that. Any other questions? 
Every news, every week, the, the news gets a little better, doesn't it, um, I think. Um, but just to remind people, we're in this for the long haul, and, um, and, uh, and we, we will need to make sure that uh, uh, we get out of our, our epidemic portion of this, or get out of our first wave, and then start planning and, uh, and, and making sure that if a second wave comes along that we're ready for it so we can stomp it down before it gets to be a big one.